right. Our next presentation is by Alice Mitchell, uh, recently at the University of Cologne, or now at the University of Cologne, well, more or less. Days, yeah, now. in a few days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and her talk is Negotiating Knowledge in Datoga Interaction. Thank you, Richard, and thank you very much for the invitation to come today. This is my first time in Leiden, so I'm very excited. Um, yeah, so today I want to present some preliminary work I've been doing uh, looking at how Datoga speakers negotiate differences in knowledge um, in their everyday conversations. Um, so I'm going to describe some of the linguistic resources used to display knowing or not knowing. Specifically, we'll have a look at questions and then we'll look at an epistemic particle, NED. Um, then we're going to have a look at how these particular resources are actually used in everyday interaction. Um, and in particular, I'll be focusing on um, children's use of these resources. So uh, I've been working on a project looking at language socialization and how children acquire certain types of knowledge. So I've got lots of um, natural interaction data from children. So that's why I've been um, focusing on, on their use of language. But it's also quite interesting because, of course, with children, you often get quite large knowledge differentials between a child and an adult or a child and an older peer. Um, so this research has a kind of a linguistic goal, so looking at the particular linguistic resources that are available, um, how they work. But there's also an anthropological um, goal of this research, which is looking at um, the extent to which Datoga children's use of this of these linguistic resources reveal something about how they understand social organization. Um, so I'm interested in things like, you know, what kinds of questions children ask and who they ask them to, um, and see whether that tells us anything about how they think about seniority, age, gender, this kind of stuff. Okay, um, so language and knowledge. Um, so when we talk about language and knowledge, most linguists will probably think about evidential systems um, you know, as one major linguistic phenomenon, grammatical encoding of information about source of knowledge. Um, I'm not going to really be talking about evidentials at all today. I'll be talking about a different dimension of language and knowledge, um, which uh, Evans and Al, in a recent paper um, in Language and Cognition, have been, have been discussing. Um, so this is a concept they call engagement, um, and it's to do with who has access to knowledge and how speakers and addressees negotiate that. Um, so this is a engagement for them is very much a grammaticalized phenomenon, um, what they call grammaticalized in intersubjectivity. Uh, and they discuss how important this intersubjective alignment is for human interaction. So this is a quote from their recent paper, achieving intersubjectivity lies at the heart of how human communication systems evolved. But beyond this, speakers in real time need constantly to bring about adjustments to each other's attention, beliefs, and states of knowledge. Um, and I find all that stuff super interesting. So they have this, this term engagement, which they've um, taken from, from someone else's work, but they're kind of you know, making it a bit, trying to make it a big concept in linguistics. So this is grammaticalized properties of languages that have to do with coordinating attitudes or states of knowledge. Um, so today, uh, I'm not going to be talking about grammaticalized aspects of engagement. Um, the, the functional domain of kind of non-grammaticalized epistemic management is also of, of big interest at the moment in linguistics. Um, and yeah, I'll be talking about these more kind of lexical, non-grammatical ways of managing who knows what um, in conversation. So epistemic marking in, in African languages. One of the points made in the Evans et al. paper from last year is how much we, how, how much, how little we know about uh, the grammar of engagement in the languages of the world. Um, and I think this is probably true for African languages as well. So evidentials not widely attested in Africa, although Eichenwald puts that um, down to oversight rather than absence. Um, we do find grammaticalized evidentials in some nilotic languages. So um, Storch has described a evidential prefix in Luo. Um, there's also a little bit of work on evidential marking in Shilluk. Um, then more kind of similar to what I'll be talking about today, Dimondal has done a survey of what he calls attitude markers in nilotic, um, which actually includes quite a wide range of different kinds of discourse particles and modal particles. But some of the ones he 
he describes um, do encode epistemic meanings. So he's, uh, he talks about a couple of different examples. Um, in Turkana, for example, there's this bo particle, which seems to index epistemic authority. So, um, you know, negotiating who has the right to, to say what. Oops. Um, oh, yeah, that's not <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, let's, let's move on. How about the Tanzanian Rift Valley area more specifically? So it's very exciting to have lots of experts gathered in this room. Um, as far as I, I can tell, there's not a great deal of research on epistemic language or on evidentials um, in Rift Valley languages, but I've not done an in-depth review, so hopefully some people can, can enlighten me a little bit um, about some of this stuff. So looking at the literature, um, Sandawi, both um, Stehman and Eaton talk about some epistemic clitics that have to do with this kind of knowledge negotiation. Um, so that that's quite an interesting comparative case potentially. Uh, for Iraku, Martin has um, documented a series of sentential adverbs, some of which have these kinds of epistemic meanings, at least to do with the certainty um, of the speaker, things like that. De Toga, as far as I know, there's no grammaticalized evidentials, also no grammaticalized engagement system, uh, but it does have this dedicated epistemic particle, NED, which I'm going to talk to you about in, in a moment. And another way in which speakers negotiate knowledge differentials in all known languages is by questions. Um, and there's research on, quite a little bit of research on questions in Iraku, um, and also Richards looked at them in Asimjig, De Toga. Um, but not, I don't think there's tons of research out there um, in the Rift Valley area at the moment. So we'll have a, a look at those today. Okay, just a bit of background about De Toga. Many of you here are already very familiar um, with De Toga, but for anyone who isn't, I'll give you a bit of background. So De Toga is a southern Nilotic language spoken primarily in northern Tanzania, though increasingly also in other parts of the country. Um, De Toga is an umbrella ethnic identity uh, so there are sort of subgroups within De Toga, um, and it's also, it's also a dialect cluster. So today, my research has focused on Barabaig and Gisam Janga, um, two, two of the major dialects in the group. Um, and when I say De Toga, I'm ref really referring to Barabaig and Gisam Janga. I'm just a bit lazy to say Barabaig and Gisam Janga De Toga every single time, okay. But that's worth bearing in mind. So Barabaig and Gisam Janga communities were traditionally semi-nomadic cattle herders. Um, nowadays, many are much more sedentary. They also practice some agriculture, um, although cattle remain still of, of very important economic and cultural significance. Um, in terms of language size, so it's not as big as Iraku that we just heard about. There's estimated to be about 160,000 speakers of the language, although um, some De Toga would estimate that number is a lot higher, in fact, but we don't, don't yet have a good idea. Um, I've conducted all my field work in Mbulu district in Manyara region um, in and around the town of Haidam and then three rural uh, villages are in that area. Um, a lot of my time has been spent in a village called Eshkesh which is in the Yaida Valley and this is a photo of um, my host family in Eshkesh just after uh, one of the adult women got back from the market and she's distributing um, Bob Marley bags which is very exciting for all these children. <laughs> um, okay, in terms of the data that I'm using, uh, basing this research on, so I have a, been building a corpus of De Toga conversational interaction, um, which is currently about 140,000 words. Um, and the, most of the child language data has been collected in Eshkesh in that single household. And I'll talk a, a little bit about that later on. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so, so I'm gonna, we're going to look at questions and then we're going to look at this epistemic particle. And then we'll, we'll um, the third part of the talk, then we'll, we'll see how children are, are using those in their everyday interactions. So we've got two types of questions in De Toga, uh, like most languages. So we've got content questions and polar questions. Um, content questions in De Toga are formed using in situ interrogative words. Um, there's a list of them here. Not totally sure about all the tones there. Um, <laughs> that's always a little tricky with the, the rising intonation. We are still muted, everyone. Um, 
And yeah, then there's also an interrogative nominal prefix, ana, which uh, prefixes to a noun to mean which, x. Um, and then another kind of question formation, content question formation in Datoga is through verbal de derivation. This is something um, to look at further. So you can say things like ginaldin, meaning um, how do you know that? Okay, so content question is a little bit more complicated than just using these interrogative words. Um, Datoga is a verb initial language, but it has fairly flexible word order for its nominal arguments. However, question words uh, seem to be very restricted in their position in the clause, so they almost always directly follow the verb, um, as in this example. Um, and at least in my corpus of data, the question words are not attested pre-verbally. Um, so here's an example. Um, Dede, who brought the water? So we get water brought who? Um, and then in the response, Gwedu Uchimbu, um, Uchimbu brought it, again, we get the, the subject following the verb. Um, so perhaps there's a preference for new information to occur post-verbally in Datoga. That might be what's um, restricting these question words. That's, we haven't really looked at um, information structure in, in Datoga yet. Okay, as for polar questions, um, there's no special interrogative syntax or question particles for polar questions. Rather, they rely on rising pitch for their interpretation. Um, so this is a very straightforward example. Someone asks, at our house, um, and you can see the blue line on the spectrogram indicating the rising pitch, and someone responds, yes, at your house, um, with a fairly level, level pitch there. To answer polar questions, Datoga typically uses interjections. Um, so you've got the affirmative token air and the negative token manda, but you also have other options like ah, ah, mm, mm, and so on. Um, yeah. Although, actually, in this example, you also get repetition as well as the, um, as well as the interjection. OK, so that was a, a brief intro to questions. Um, moving on to the second feature that I'll be looking at, um, this is an epistemic particle, NERD. So this is an optional particle that relates to both the speaker and the addressee's attitudes to what is being said. So I would call it a complex perspective marker following Bergqvist. Um, so I'll show you an example in a moment and then it'll be clearer. But um, in declarative utterances, it ind indicates that the speaker holds the proposition to be true um, and that A also already knows or should already know that it's true. Okay, so it's, it's taking on board both the speaker's access to the knowledge and the addressee's aspect, um, access to the knowledge. Okay. Um, so it's indexing shared epistemic access, saying, you know, in terms of epistemic hierarchy, both the speaker and the addressee uh, should know this or do have access to the same kinds of knowledge. Okay. So, for example, um, this is a child speaking to his mother. Um, so he calls his mother, Manganga, and she responds, Oi, and there's a little bit of disfluency. And then he asks, um, is a pen used for something? Okay, so he's seen me using a pen a lot. Um, so this is his question. Um, does a pen have a job? Is a pen used for something? And the mother answers, eh, yes. It's for writing, isn't it? Is kind of the, the English translation with that tag question. Um, so what this ne'er does is it kind of indicates you already know this, right? Um, so, you know, it, it projects a, a disjunction in how the child has presented himself as not knowing about a pen um, and actually what he does or in fact already know, okay? So, so hopefully that. So that's a declarative example. Um, it also frequently occurs in interrogatives. Um, so so uh, utterances with rising intonation. In this case, this is a little complicated. So it implies that the speaker knows and the addressee should know that the proposition is the opposite to the polarity value of the question. So if it's an affirmative polar question, then it, then it implies it's not true. And if it's a negative question, that it is true. Okay. Um, so for example, this is a... A uh, little extract from a conversation. Mother and child are talking about a, a solar lamp that has broken. Um, the mother, I guess, has implied that the child broke it. And he says, Nerd again, Yardi, Anni, did I break it? With this Nerd again implying, I didn't break it, and you know I didn't break it. Okay, so it's got that kind of um, 
in English, often that would be something we would do with a tag question, right? Um, okay, so the effect of the NED is to indicate, um, you know, that the child knows he did not break the torch and to question the addressee's epistemic stance towards the state of affairs. Uh, and then in response, the mother confirms this shared knowledge now that it wasn't him that broke it, it was Bayanga, okay, the other brother um, who broke it. Um, okay, in terms of syntax and semantics, so I haven't um, gone into great depth looking at the kind of grammatical and syntactic constraints. So in, in Dimandar's review of, of different kinds of attitude particles, he talks about how some of them are restricted to certain tense aspect mood um, constructions. Not sure to what extent that's the case here. In terms of word order, it typically occurs in turn initial or turn final position, which is what we'd expect. And semantically, it's taking wide scope over the whole proposition. So it's putting the whole proposition into question. Uh, another little variant I found is Near the air, um, air being a, a conjunction, um, that we'll see an example later on. That only occurs pre-verbally. Um, I'm not, not totally sure um, of the semantic or pragmatic differences yet. Okay, so, um, so I want to have a look now, a, a fairly brief look at how children use these kinds of epistemic resources available to them in the language and what they do with them. So. As a preliminary study, I've taken a small sample of six recordings, um, which were made in, in a single household in 2017. And these are screenshots from, from some of those recordings. Um, so that it amounts to about three hours of video and a half hour of audio. Uh, there's nine children aged between around three and 13. Um, and I'll start with the epistemic particle NED, because there's not quite so much to, to report there. Um, so, actually, in my sample data, I only found 11 occurrences of this form, and the youngest child to use this form was six years old, um, which I think perhaps tells us something quite interesting about the acquisition of epistemic language. Um, so, using a form like NED relies on the ability to take two perspectives at once, right? Your own perspective and then also what you think the addressee knows, and we know that's right, related to stuff like theory of mind. Um, known to be quite challenging for young children. So that's, that's probably why we're only seeing these kinds of, um, you know, pragmatic abilities emerging around six years of age. Um, and then the older children use NED, as we'd expect, to challenge another person's epistemic stance, the knowledge that they have presented. Um, and there's lots of different reasons that, that children might do this. So we'll have a, a little look at um, our video. So we'll... I, I'm not sure you're to hear the sound. Oh, uh, oh, okay, so um, what we've got here is a brother and a sister, the slightly older sister. She has um, ordered her brother to go get some fire from their grandmother's house to light the fire, and he's refusing to go. Okay. Um, so, so. Yeah, so I'll just have a quick look at the transcript. So, so she orders him, go get the fire gauge out. Um, he says no. And actually, even before this, she's already asked him and he's refused. Um, and then he offers this kind of justification for why he's not going to, to get the fire. He says, Sagerlan, their grandmother, will be annoyed. She'll say, what are you opening the door for? Um, because she's napping. That's the, uh, the cultural <laughs> context you need to understand that. Um, so, you know, she's sleeping, I can't go get the fire. Uh, and then the sister, first of all, says, ja, because she's annoyed with him. It's an um, interjection indexing frustration. Uh, and then she says, hasn't she got up with this nerd particle again? So, um, you know, it's emphasizing the fact that the, the brother also has equal epistemic access to the fact that the grandmother's awake, as does she. Um, and therefore, his justification for not following the request is, you know, invalid. Um, so, so yeah, and in, and in this case, this kind of, this, this form, which is, you know, really targeting that kind of epistemic alignment, um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily achieve in, in subjective alignment because he just rejects this too and says, ja, um, back to him, back to her, okay. So what this particle allows the child to do here 
is you know, highlight what she thinks the brother already knows, um, and also in combination with lots of other linguistic resources, such as this ja interje interjection and the prosody and the volume, she, she uses it also to deliver a kind of rebuke um, for not following her directive. Okay, so, so that was an example of NED. Now we'll have a, a quick look at how children use questions. Um, so in that sample data, the, the six recordings, um, I identified 92 questions in my sample data. Um, and I identified these questions on the basis of they contain a question word or um, they have rising in intonation, okay, as well as the fact that they initiate a response. So they were understood as questions um, by the addressee. So there were 40% um, content questions and 60% polar questions. And obviously, these questions serve many, many, many different pragmatic functions. Requests for information, straightforwardly, confirmation requests, complaints, teasing, challenges like we already saw, and so on. Um, from from um, a sort of more anthropological point of view, I was interested in looking at the request for information specifically. So who do, when children want to know something, who do they ask and how do they ask it? Um, and I found that actually almost equal numbers of requests for information were directed at younger participants as well as older. So there weren't clear age constraints on who is asking whom questions. I kind of was thinking maybe something like you'd see sibling hierarchy a little bit in you know, who's asking whom for knowledge, um, which <clears throat> didn't really seem to be the case. However, if you look at the types of information that are being um, elicited, then those that target general knowledge uh, were asked only of adults. So things like um, questions about um, the outside world, markets, and so on. What is the meaning of a particular word? Um, is this a phone top-up voucher? These kinds of questions were only directed at, at adults because they're much more likely to know the answer. So this brings us to the idea of um, what John Heritage has called territories of knowledge. Um, so what you can expect other people to know about. Um, mm -hmm. And in this next example, um, and slightly, so these, these are, this is a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, he is the classificatory father of this child, although they don't really know that yet. Um, and, and, this, and this child, the older child's going to ask the younger child a question. And I like this example because it shows how the negotiation of knowledge among even very young children is very sensitive to social relationships, um, specifically those of kinship. So they're digging a hole outside um, this, ch this child's mother's house, okay, which is a bit bad thing to do. Um, there are no adults present except me, so they're you know, taking the opportunity to make a huge mess. Um, dig a great hole in the ground. Uh, and then the older boy asks um, the younger boy this question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so the first child um, says, is Mangangan going to beat us today, Madotai? So Mangangan is the mother of Madotai. It's her house where they're um, digging this hole. Um, and then my daughter answers, no, everything's fine, okay. <laughs> um, so first of all, you know, this question implies that <laughs> digging a hole in front of someone's house is a potentially punishable activity, um, and as such, the older child is displaying an understanding of some kind of moral order. He's imagining how that mother might react to the hole digging. Um, but this question also shows us how the older child is orienting to this three-year-old child's territory of knowledge um, as defined in terms of kin relations and place, right? So the questionable activity is taking place outside the younger child's mother's house, and it's his mother who's likely to be displeased. Um, so in asking a question, the, the older child presents himself as not knowing, um, and he cedes the rights to know about the mother's response to their behavior to the younger son, to the boy. Okay, so we see how the, the younger child's identity as the mother's son is made relevant in this little tiny snippet of conversation. Um, and the younger child completely accepts that he has the rights to know, right? He's, he answers, no, she, she won't mind at all, which she did. <laughs> um, yeah, so here we see children drawing on their um, understandings of social relationships and how those relationships affect what one can know or can expect to know about other people. 
Okay, so summing up, um, we've looked at a different, a uh, couple of different linguistic means for negotiating knowledge. So we've had this complex perspective marker NED um, and the inter interrogative utterances, which both allow speakers to negotiate who knows what. Um, so we've seen how, so questions can position the speaker as not knowing and the addressee as knowing, as in the last example. Or similarly to NED, questions can actually position both speaker and addressee as having access to the same knowledge, um, as in rhetorical questions. And um, those are used a lot in the Togo interaction, I would say. Um, these, this strategy of, of you know, negotiating these smaller bits of knowledge, of course, form part of much larger pragmatic activities, like rebuking someone, telling someone to do something. Um, and then with, these, with this last example, we saw that when children position themselves as not knowing, um, with respect to others, they show sensitivity to social attributes like age and kinship relations. Um, so this is, this is all quite preliminary work that I've been doing. Um, and for the next steps, um, I would be wanting to look a bit closer at how are the syntactic properties of NERD, um, collect as many examples as possible. Um, and then also another discourse particle that um, has caught my attention is ha, which um, if people work on the toga, it's, I guess the thing with these epistemic particles is the moment that you start recording conversation, they're all there all the time and then, you know, you become interested in them. Um, so this is a particle that attaches to question words, um, but it's also just a very high frequency item in conversation in general, in interrogatives, in imperatives and declarative. So it would be interesting to kind of get a handle on ex precisely what it's doing. Um, and I kind of assume it also has something to do with epistemic access. Um, another interesting question is whether there are any sociolinguistic patterns guiding the use of epistemic particles. Um, so, you know, if you're speaking to someone who's a lot senior to you, you know, would it be impolite to some, assume something about what they know? And would that mean that you would be less likely to use these kinds of epistemic particles? I think that would be an interesting direction to go in. Um, and then, yeah, in thinking about our Rift Valley network, how does epistemic marking work in, in neighboring languages? Do we find equivalent kinds of particles? Um, is any of this kind of epistemic or evidential stuff grammaticalized in any way in any of the languages of the area? Um, that would be also very interesting to know. So thank you all for listening. Um, yeah. That's Uh, thank you very much, Alice. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. Andrew, is there something you want to say? I can say right off the bat okay. that if you, need to, if you want to say, isn't it, mm -hmm. in Ihanzu, you use ne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an enclitic. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's not, it's not exactly the same position, but it's an interesting, mm -hmm. it's an interesting sort of parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yes. I was wondering about, uh, with the term engagement, how this relates to information structure, because I see information structure is also involving uh, what the speaker knows, what the hearer yeah. knows, what's in the common ground. And I was wondering if that would help find more literature relevant mm. to these questions as mm -hmm. well, because it's not, now I don't know whether it's part of engagement or not, or mm. whether you see them as different phenomena, mm -hmm. but it seems like the same questions can be investigated through information structure as well. Yeah, absolutely, that's a really good point. I think. So um, Evans et al. are quite keen to, to kind of show that um, these sort of epistemic access questions can be grammaticalized and are in a lot of languages in the world. And so they're quite keen to sort of <coughs> put it on a par with something like tense or aspect. But, you know, they have to, there's so many other, I mean, there's loads of literature on epistemics um, from a more kind of functional perspective. As you say, information structure absolutely um, intersects with all that. So, um, I think it's kind of a question of is your interest more in the you know the formal grammaticalized aspect of it or in the in the much broader domain, um, and I think you know in that paper well it's a series of two papers they're you know keen to show that it's, it's you know it's so important in a lot of languages that it's grammaticalized mm -hmm. but but yeah you're absolutely right. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Here. Thanks, Iris. Um, I was curious about your explanation for the frequency of the particle versus the question. Mm -hmm. So you have 60% of polar questions 
Mm-hmm. And if I would have thought that my questions were also, uh, as you said yourself, a kind of negotiation. Yes, yes. So I'm wondering whether the explanation for only 11 tokens of men mm. is indeed the Actually, point, that's a very good point. The point of the mm. complexity of mm. that negotiation. Mm. And I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, I should go back and look at those examples and pose questions because, as you say, even younger children might be using those as a way to say, you know, yes, you do know that. Or, right. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've looked at the. I haven't um, broken those questions down <coughs> at age, but that would be a really interesting thing to do anyway. I kind of, part of the reason that I was starting to look at this is I had the impression that very young children just don't really ask questions, like they sort of present themselves as knowledgeable about the world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I never actually went as far to, to see, you know, um, is that for you or how many questions are they asking? But yeah, you know, that's a very. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the content questions may be not in the same way as Ned, but mm-hmm. the proposed the questions, questions yeah. might look more, would probably be more uh, mm. the same kind of Yes. Language. I suppose that it's always difficult to... Mm, because you assume that this person knows. It, yes. And I don't know. And, yeah, but I mean, when children are using these forms, you know, how can we know that they've really understood the pragmatics of it as right. well? That's a additional... Problem or whether they're just sort of in it, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Okay. Yeah, what I find very interesting is the kind of meanings that you get. So uh, this 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 meaning of the ne. Mm. Um, and uh, in Iraq there is a mak which indicates uh, that you know I'm telling you this. Uh, but in the near future, you're going to hear something that will that will make you conclude that this is actually not the whole truth. Oh, wow. uh, and and what, what I find interesting is that those are very useful, uh, yeah, units of meaning, and 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 I don't know how general they are. I, mm. I'm sort of yeah surprised by the fact that other languages then don't have it. Yeah. I know. I've been thinking about that. This too. Why is it that you know you you would have m- more means to talk about this stuff in some languages than than other? Yeah. Or to express this. In so do, what what kind of things are grammaticalized? So do you know of any study that does what kind of these more detailed kind of uh, epistemics uh, get grammaticalized in such a concrete thing as a word? So the the nice example that the engagement paper starts with is. Um, I've forgotten the language, but it's a, um, an auxiliary that you can either, that you, I think you can have four options for what the speaker knows and what the addressee knows, and that, you know, it's completely paradigmatic. Um, but I'm not sure anyone's got as far as, I mean, yeah, there must be work on the grammaticalization of it, but um, I'm not. Yeah, we need a framework in, of what kind of, uh, yeah, sort of basic notions. Mm we do have in this domain. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's really, it really gets quite complicated yeah. perspective taking. Yeah. 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 Okay, time for one more question and comment. All right, I have my own then. <laughs> uh, so uh, as I, I think I've heard also in Swahili and in Asim Jigdatoga, there's sort of a negative rhetorical question mm. uh, construction that you can use. like. You know, well, didn't we arrive today already? Yes. Something like that, yeah. which is somewhat yeah. comparable. And um, yeah, I've seen that very frequently uh, in use among the SMJ, jig, especially uh, um, as spoken by uh, older speakers or younger speakers, kind mm-hmm. of saying, well, like, well, don't you already know this? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah, come yeah. on. Yeah. So maybe that's yeah, something else yeah. to look at. I find it really striking how often that happens in the type of interaction, that yeah. something's phrased mm-hmm. negatively um, in that way. The other thing, I guess, for any Swahili experts would be like the particle Kwani mm-hmm. uh, also has this kind of epistemic mm-hmm. access thing going on, right? Um, and that was often how Ned got translated mm-hmm. by, by my consultants. Mm-hmm. All right, well, thank you, Alice. <laughs>